but uh, we have a heterogeneous group of boys and girls still learning is uh, okay whether you are md or mbbs or dm it does not matter okay so yes. i will do something if there is any difficulty you can ask me yes so uh, now we will i will go through you know, what is this a practice as we know um, is we, we have um, it's a problem with the motor function so what exactly is this motor function uh, we now got uh, to carry out each movement there is a uh, complex cascade uh, constantly we are moving some body part or another but uh, as it is nicely balanced in our system we really don't understand it so what is the this is a complex cascade transforming neural signals into useful activity so so many signals are there what is there in the environment what is there inside us what we have to copy what we have to um, uh, triage you know so all these are finally processed into useful activity so the the, the type of movements that we normally see are sensory triggered or reflex movements sensory means you have got various sense organs you see a frightening scene then you have to run you see a beautiful scene you have to move close to that or you see something which is edible you have to go and take it so they are all sensory triggered movements which are reflex movements then we have build movements ball and array you are participating in a running race so you have to build that this much distance i should cover in this much time they are build movements so sensory triggered movements are reflex movements based on information coming from the sense organ build movements are ball and array you fix some goal and carry out a movement that has got a different motor plan and we have got involuntary movements like the beating of the heart breathing movement of intestines they are all involuntarily happening and there can be abnormal involuntary movements normal involuntary movements are typically breathing heart beat intestinal movements are all voluntary um, uh, involuntary involuntary um, movements so we have got three types of movements sensory triggered movements build movements and involuntary uh, movements and uh, so this is so complex that you have to believe that everything happens due to the divine power or the universal consciousness that exists in us why who could design every small thing in the body so beautifully so we have to think of the universal consciousness as the person under this so we shall approach this abnormality in the movement system is apraxia in the absence of paralysis so we shall go defining and go through the various aspects of this so what is praxis praxis is the ability to we saw that you have got sensory triggered movement build movements and involuntary movement and praxis is the ability to formulate skilled movements in a non peritic limb by planning a schema based on stored complex representations and previously learned movements that means you have a schema for all these type of movements which we saw sensory triggered movements voluntary movements or the build movements and the involuntary movements should take place in a particular sequence in a non paralytic limb in a normal body part these movements happen by a schema and this is stored either default for involuntary movements it's a default story and for learned or set movements it is a Uh, based on previous experience we try to carry out a movement so that is called praxis what is apraxia the apraxia is inability to carry out a learned motor act on command in the absence of motor sensory or cerebellar defect so praxis is that formula which carries out these three kinds of movements based on a motor plan and also learned by how do you pick a fruit and eat how do i mix my food and eat? these are all learned movements so a previous default mode network or learned movements are carried out in a normal movement normal limb so in the normal limb only if you are not able to carry out these movements so the limb should be normal you should not be paralyzed you should not have sensory impairment you should not have cerebellar defect in that situation you are unable to carry out this motor plan that is called apraxia so what is the anatomical basis we have, we have got so many postulates this is called leap man circuit here what happens you see supposing uh, you hear a command 
you have to move a body part. The command is registered in the Varnikis area and that is carried to the parietal lobe. Parietal lobe will compare it with the body schema. We have got a body schema. Where is your hand? Where is your head? Where is your leg? All this schema. And you have been told to carry out a movement with that body part. So this command is carried to the body schema. And body schema says, here is your right hand. Now you have to move it to that plane. So that processing is done in the parietal lobule. And then it is carried to the supplementary motor area where the motor schema is prepared. And then to the motor area, from there, it is carried out through the corticospinal tract. So command is received. So that is for the right side. For the left side, what happens? The same schema is processed on the left side, then transported across the corpus callosum to the opposite motor cortex. So that is for the left side. So this is the Leapman's praxis circuit. You receive the command, send it to the parietal lobule, compare it with the body schema, and decide which is the direction in which this has to be moved. Then that command is carried to the supplementary motor area. Motor schema is formed, then to the motor area to carry it out on the right side. And across the corpus callosum to the left side for the, uh, to the opposite side for the left side of limb. So this is leap man praxis circuit. We have got so many people have said different, different but they are all uh, similar only with minor modification. <laughs> this is Rothi and Heelman spatio-temporal representation of learned movements. Uh, actually, the most accepted one is the Leapman's. So here he said that how do you execute a learned motor movement? You have got an anterior execution. We know that the frontal loop, which contains the motor area, supplementary motor area, and the prefrontal area has got the executive function. So anteriorly, you have got the executive function. And posteriorly, you have got a conceptual representation. It is almost the same only posteriorly in the parietal and language area. The concept is formed and it is represented. And this conceptual representation is carried to the anterior executive area. That is Rothi and Heelman hypothesis. Then we have got a, uh, what happens in disease? This one's disconnection model. What he says, you have got the language area on the dominant side. Uh, also the dominant side, the language area receives the command. And then it is processed and combined with the body schema in the parietal lobule, then carried to the supplementary motor area. So if there is a lesion disconnecting the command processing unit from the executing unit, the executing unit is the premotor and the motor area, then it results in apraxia. So that is called Gestrin's disconnection model, <laughs> where the received area to the executing area, there is a disconnection. So these are the uh, anatomy, Leapman's and the Rothman's uh, models for uh, how it is happening and how the disease comes is the Gestrin's disconnection model. So we'll go next. So what is a motor engram? All of us know about the engrams in memory. What is an engram memory when you repeatedly study a subject that forms specific circuits, uh, data linking circuits in the temporal lobe. And this you repeatedly rehearse. You are having an exam, you so many times you study. By rehearsal, this electrical circuit becomes highly facilitated. When the electrical circuit becomes highly facilitated, it produces firing and wiring. So a uh, facilitated circuit is firing. And this firing results in wiring. So they become connected. The neighboring neurons become connected. And there is an anatomical and a genetic and a neurotransmitter change. Initially, it is electrical firing. This electricity leads to anatomical linkage, chemical change, and genetic change. That highly facilitated circuit is called engram, which is the fundamental unit of memory. Similarly, for a motor activity, you have got a motor engram. So what is that motor engram? Motor engram is, a, we all know about the engrams in memory. So what is this motor engram? It is a space-time plan. You see, you have to carry out your body part in, a, in an action within a particular period of time. If a tiger is coming, you cannot wait and slowly move. So it's a space-time plan conveyed by the left parietal lobe to the pre-central cortex and the white matter. So motor engram, we saw the uh, Leapman's model where uh, this is taking place. This 
space time plan which is formulated by the parietal lobe is called as the motor engram this transforms images of intended actions to appropriate motor command so you want to run away from the tiger so that is the intended motor action this intended motor action is converted into appropriate motor movements by this space time plan which is called motor engram so it's a spatio temporal representation space and time within a particular period an activity has to take place so spatio temporal representation of a more learned motor activity stored in the left inferior parietal lobe you send to the motor area that forms the motor engram motor area converts it into a motor plan that is what we saw and this whole thing which has got a physiological circuit that is called motor engram so uh, so how instruction of the motor system is so you have to carry out a motor ac action for that how so the how instruction of the motor system in positioning your body part <coughs> for a particular activity then using some tools supposing you want to carve something out and you need some tools so how to position your body part these are the functions of the motor engram and how are you going to use your tool how are you going to move in the space how are you going to decide the speed how are you going to decide the force and how are you going to solve problems in case you are trying to run away from a tiger on the way you see a lion so it's an unexpected intrusion then at that time how are you going to deviate and achieve the goal of survival so these are the uh, activities of the motor engram so how instructions of the motor system in positioning body parts performing with tools move in space decide speed decide the time and the force and solve un unexpected encounters when they happen so we have, for this we have got a conceptual system we have got a production system we have got a imitation system and a gestural buffer what is this conceptual system conceptual system is an action semantic system action understanding system it's an abstract knowledge of object functioning which includes use or not use a tool pandamai man action convert single action into a sequence of action so this is the concept so what uh, it's a meaning of a uh, concept that you are going to carry out we will not carry out all the activities we will carry out actions which are of relevance to us so this abstract knowledge of object function which includes using imitating converting single actions into multiple sequence that has a system that is called conceptual system we saw it is the language area to the parietal lobe and what is the production system so production system is knowledge of the action in sensory motor plan so we have seen now there is a tiger you have to run so which are the body parts should be put in action which body part should be suppressed so that is the conceptual understanding of the situation and the production system is knowledge of action how this will be carried out is the production system that we saw supplementary motor area and motor area and the corpus callosum for the non dominant side next is the imitation system all of us learn by imitating our parents or friends or neighbors so imitation system is a mechanism which transports movements from a different body schema involving conversion of mechanisms of visual input into motor action so we certain things are common for all of us how we say good morning how we say goodbye so these are learned from the uh, motor activity of another person and that is an imitation system which converts the movements in another person into movements in self and gestural buffer involves mirror neurons mapping observed actions and performed actions and combines visual and somatomotor sensory signals for maintaining configuration of self and non self you see uh, this mirror neurons is an action perception system so they perceive the actions of others and they understand it is others or it is self based on certain phenomena so that is the gestural buffer so gestures are there and you see that and you know that by the help of the mirror neurons that it is not in your body but it is in somebody else's body 
imitation system is a thing which you have to learn somebody is doing something and you have to learn and do it that's the learning of the motor activity whereas gestural buffer is trying to understand that this particular movement is not in my body it is taking place in the body of somebody who is in front of me so that is the gestural buffer so uh, so what is the role of left parietal region we saw it i am telling in different different angles so learning and converting mental images of intended action into a motor execution so it will get the information from the language area through the conceptual system uh, understand the situation and convert this mental in the images into a action plan so how which uh, leg should go first which hand should go behind so that's the left parietal region and what is the inferior parietal lobule doing facial and temporal movement programs they are called praxicons so these movement programs like this engram i told you are called motor engram and this motor engram is carried by small small units of function they are called praxicons they are present in the inferior parietal lobule and they form a visuo kinesthetic engram or movement formula so the left parietal lobe decides the uh, intended action to be carried out and inferior parietal lobule has got movement units called praxicons or visuo kinesthetic engrams or movement formula so that will give the formula this is the formula using which uh, you carry out the movement that the left parietal lobe has told you to do and so contains action semantics that is meaning of action and conceptual systems such as tool action or object association information and general principle of tool is so this praxicon is the unit which contains the uh, mechanism to do whatever action just run or use a tool or imitate or draw or, or dress all this specific infection information is uh, stored in small small units of motor uh, memory that is called a praxicon and prefrontal region sequencing multiple arm hand and finger movement you see all movements are not involving one joint it involve multiple joints so that sequencing part is done by the prefrontal region so left parietal lobule converts the concept into the intended plan and inferior parietal lobule forms small small units of praxicon based on what you are going to do are you, you are you going to run are you going to use the tool are you going to write and prefrontal region make the sequence we should be first we should be next like that that is a prefrontal region and right parietal region integration of visual information and upper extremity movement and in performing non purposeful we sometimes tell people to imitate no meaningless gesture so this non purposeful movements are processed in the right parietal region and basal ganglia and thalamus form the subcortical motor loops in carrying out this activity and pre motor region the supplementary motor area forms the motor schema for both sides ipsilateral and contralateral and translates the movement formula into motor program before sending them on to the primary motor cortex to be mechanically carried out and sequential movements and bimanual coordination all are taking place in the pre motor region so here you see you have got a visual input for an action semantics we have got a verbal input that goes to the verbal semantics and they come to the movement formula in the left parietal lobe and then goes to the motor program on the dominant side and comes to the corticospinal tract to be carried out by the right side and through the corpus callosum to the opposite side to be carried out in the left side so significance of praxis programs so the praxis programs of the motor system provide several type of how instruction so how this is i told that for survival running away from danger using your tool or dancing movement or imitating movement so that type of how instructions including the following how to position or posture the limb in performing a skilled movement including working with tools and objects and how to move the limb in space or the spatial trajectory of a skilled movement so i have got videos but i have not put it here because there is uh, permission is needed so we have got a trajectory across here you tell the patient to uh, um, bend up so he doesn't know how to bend up 
So what he does, he lifts his hand above the head and then erects his body. Nothing to do with the hand in uh, lifting the trunk from the bend posture, but that's a trajectory apraxia. So how to position or posture the limb in performing skilled movements, including working with tools and objects. I have so many videos, but uh, I have not taken the permission from these patients. And how to move the limb in space or the spatial trajectory of the skilled movement. And how to orient the limb towards the target of the limb action. And how rapidly to move in space or the timing of a skilled movement. And how much force to apply and the direction of these forces. And how to imitate a movement. How to solve mechanical problems which come in between and how to order components of an action to achieve the goal that has to be achieved. So these are the various things which are carried out by the Praxis program. So, but the problem is though most models mean the same. We saw the Liebman's model and the other model, they all mean the same with minor changes, uh, but with minor differences, widespread cortico subcortical connection may be involved. Because there is a praxis involving several, several area. All that cannot be on the dominant language area to the parietal lobe to the supplementary motor area because you've got gait apraxia, swallowing apraxia, so many apraxia. So there may be innumerable cortical, subcortical connections which are involved than the simplified Lippmann's model. So a distributed representation is therefore postulated by a person called Holland. He says that it is not this Liebman's or the Gishwin's uh, uh, dis uh, description. It's a distributed system involving innumerable cortical subcortical connections. So what is this positive cortical tropism and the phenomena of agency? So when you have uh, the intent to capture system, intent to escape system and self-awareness system and different copy signal, what is all this? So supposing I am carrying out an activity. So positive cortical tropism is when I am lifting my hand and trying to put it on my laptop, there is not only an efferent discharge, which we saw in these circuits to move my body part, but there's an afferent copy given to the brain. Where is my hand? My hand is now closer to the laptop. So that is called the efferent cortical uh, uh, that is a positive cortical tropism, different copy signal. Not only that the uh, uh, order to carry out and position is there, the body part is giving back an input saying that I am in this plane, what next should I do? That is the positive cortical tropism. And in the escape system, so if this is not the correct one, so you have to escape from this position, move to another position. And uh, for that continuously, the copy is given to the parietal lobe. So your body schema is there, all action plans are formed and action is being carried out. During the carrying out process, the body part gives an different copy signal saying, I am I in the right plane, I am in the right plane. If you are not in the right plane, an escape system comes and repositions that. So if this is deranged, we get conditions called frontal alien hand, classical uh, colossal alien hand, Agonistic apraxia, you give a command is given for a hand, the other hand does it. That is called agonistic apraxia. Diagonistic apraxia, you give a command for one limb and opposite, exactly opposite side will do it. And intermanual conflict, both limbs fighting with each other. And left hand constantly fights and inhibits the right. So these are the things which happen when the efferent copy signal is not going. If the efferent copy signal is not how, going, what happens? If uh, small boys and girls are there, supposing uh, I am going to the hospital today and I have an attend attendance register where I sign my attendance, then the principal will know I have come. That is the efferent copy, so that I have come. But supposing I don't give the efferent copy and I am going into my OP and start seeing patients, uh, my chief will think that uh, Somebody else has come. So if you're in copy, information is not there. That results in this conflicts. That results in, then in that case, that particular movement and that particular body part is disowned by the brain. So if you do not give an efferent copy input, 
the body part is disowned by the brain, resulting in all kinds of conflict that result in frontal alien gland, classical alien gland, intermanual conflict. All these things are due to lack of different copy signal to the coparetal cortex so that the brain does not recognize that it is your body part that is carrying out this movement. Just like if you have not signed your attendance register and start seeing the OP, the principal is thinking Chandra has not come. Then who is running the OP? So there will be commotion. So that is alien hands. So next we'll go to, uh, what are the typical features of apraxia? You see, we saw the circuit, you have a command, you understand, then you carry out. But the reflex, that is sensory triggered in self. So those movements do not go through this language pathway to the parietal lobe, there's no command. Reflex uh, functions are taking place reflexively. So voluntary functions are more affected and reflex functions may go on. Then we will think this person is malingering. I told him to comb his hair. He did all kinds of funny things. But when I left the room, he took the comb and combed his hair. So that may be reflex. He saw the comb and combing. So that is an important feature of apraxia, voluntary reflex dissociation. Second is language dependent. So apraxia to call something as apraxia, it is failure of command mediated movement. So it is language dependent. So key features, one is voluntary reflex dissociation because we saw reflex movements are sensory triggered, whereas voluntary movements are language triggered. So these two are different. So there is voluntary reflex dissociation. Second, it is language dependent. Third, it is context dependent. So it is better in natural setting. That is what I said. You go to your bathroom and you take your bath, then you see your comb and reflexively, which you have been doing every day, you comb your hair and come out. So it is, but in your office room, give a comb and tell him to comb, he will be in chaos. So it's a context dependent and it fluctuates. It is not always reproducible or demonstrable and focusing the target of the movement and not the movement itself. Improves the action. You tell the patient, sir, you know the comb, look at the comb, don't think how you're going to move your limb. Then the movement is better because what you have lost is the movement engram. So if you fix on the target, the reflex component will come and work on that. So it's a general term designating complex motor deficits, not attributable to failed comprehension or attributable deficit. So it's a difficulty in carrying out a complex motor action, even though there is no failure of comprehension or no failure of motor activity. So that's, those are the key features of apraxia. And we have classification on its modality specific. That is for command or seen or with the target, without target, imitating. That is modality specific. Second is effect are specific. So it may be limb kinetic, buccopharyngeal, gait. So that's an effect are specific. Task specific. So it may be an apraxia for dressing, or it may be an apraxia for combing. So it may be a task-specific apraxia. Lesion-specific. So suppose you have got a hemiplegia. You'll have a sympathetic apraxia on the left side. So it may be lesion-specific, or it may be function-specific. Only one function, like walking. One function, like swallowing, alone is affected. So these are the various classification. One is the modality-specific apraxia, effect of specific apraxia, task-specific apraxia, lesion-specific apraxia, and function-specific apraxia. So what are these modality-specific apraxia? Pandamium apraxia. Pandamium apraxia, you tell the patient to imitate. Conduction apraxia. Here, with object, you are more uh, difficult. Without object, you are better. That is conduction apraxia. We show imitative, the imitation of gestures. Then optical apraxia, we show motor and tactile apraxia. These are the modality specific apraxia and effect on specific apraxia, upper limb, lower limb, mouth, buccofacial, lid, ocular muscles, limb and trunk and legs. And you have got a task specific, gait. So while walking alone, it is having, that's a task specific. Gait apraxia, gait apraxia. You tell the patient, ocular motor apraxia, tell the patient to look to the right, he's unable to do. Reflexly he is moving, that is gait, gait apraxia. Apraxia for speech, apraxia for writing, apraxia for dressing, 
or disynchronous apraxias, orienting apraxias, and mirror apraxias. They are task specific apraxia, lesion specific apraxia, callosal apraxia, sympathetic apraxia, and crossed apraxia. So we will deal with what is all this subsequently. And uh, well, that is a region specific classification. What is functional classification? It is ideational, ideomotor, limb kinetic. Ideational, ideomotor. This is the thing which is commonly used, ideational, ideomotor, limb kinetic. What is this ideational apraxia? Disturbance in the, we saw that there is a conceptual system and you have got an executive system. So ideational apraxia is disturbance in the conceptual organization of action due to condemned errors in single action, that is action semantic memory. So they will know this is the comb, this is the pen, this is the brush. So they know all these objects. They know the object by name and object by looks. But then what is the use of that? So it's a dissociation between the ability to recognize the tool and the ability to use the tool. That is uh, ideational apraxia. You identify the comb, identify the brush, but try to brush with the comb. So that is ideational. Conceptual organization of action of the tool is dis dissociated from the tool itself and no impairment in action execution per se. But, uh, so they know to comb. But instead of taking the comb, they take the brush. So, but demonstrate inappropriate use of objects and may fail in gesture discrimination and matching task. So here, the action itself is all right in ideational apraxy. They know the tool, they know the action, but they do not match the tool and the action. So they know what is a comb, they know how to comb, but they take the brush and comb. That is ideational apraxy. So this is actually uh, not applicable for us because brushing with the finger is considered ideational apraxia, but in our country, many people brush. So you have to specifically tell, use the object here and brush. Then if they use the finger, it is an ideational apraxia. What is ideomotor apraxia? It's a production component of the praxis. So they know the object, they use the right object, but they are not able to do the sequencing of the object concerned to carry out the correct object, correct activity. So uh, they, if you tell them to uh, light a candle, they will not take a, a comb and try to candle. They will take the matchbox, they will take the candle, but they will hold it as if what to do. So they take the object, identify the object, uh, take the right object, but do not know the sequence in which they have to carry it out. So they will hold it. Whether I should take the, open the matchbox first or put the candle first or uh, how do I do it? So that's a sequencing error. We saw it's a prefrontal lobe that is involved in that. They do not misuse the tool in a conceptual system. And, uh, but, uh, so ideomotor apraxia is present. When the knowledge of the task is there and use the right task, uh, target, uh, to, uh, object only. But uh, there is a spatial error in performance. So instead of opening the matchbox and striking the matchstick, they will take the candle and put it there and hold the matchbox like that. But the objects are not changed. Whereas in ideational apraxia, objects are changed. In ideomotor apraxia, objects are correctly chosen. But the order in which it is to be done is not uh, wrong. And uh, this video also is not there. Next is the limb kinetic apraxia. It is slowness or stiffness of movements with loss of precise independent movement of fingers. So voluntary automatic dissociation. Limb is not paralyzed, but patient says my limb is stiff. I don't know how to keep it. I am unable to move my limb. That is limb kinetic. And copying meaningless hand positions difficult than meaningful positions. You give some gestures, meaningless gest uh, gestures means they have to learn a motor activity and carry it out. That is difficult. They use real objects properly and uh, bradykinesia may be there uh, uh, like slowing and anatomy is in the supplementary motor area and the basal ganglia. Typically, it is seen in corticobasal degeneration. Testing is done with 
<coughs> pegboard wire you fix objects flip a coin coin rotation fix small coins so these are all limb kinetic apraxia what is this alien hand i said that when there is a failure of positive cortical tropism alien hand happens so principle of agency is lost as i told when the teacher comes and signs a register and goes to the class the principal knows teacher has come teacher has not signed he will think somebody else is in the class so that is principle of agency thinking my teacher has come or my body part is doing this activity that is lost when the body part is not sending efferent copy signal of his position so, so brain thinks the whichever body part is moving does not belong to me so hence unaware it is self generated and alien hand unwilled and uncontrolled actions of the left hand because it is independent because it is not giving information body is not taking ownership the brain is not taking ownership if it doesn't take ownership it will not give instruction if the principal doesn't know this is my teacher he will not give instructions to her so the teacher will do what she wants that is unwilled and uncontrolled action of the left hand and optical sensory apraxia is spontaneous left arm movement like a volitional slapping pinching of someone's own body part so optical sensory apraxia is a situation where the body schema is disturbed doesn't know which body part belong to itself so the left arm will move around and slapping its own self to know what is this this is my body part or something else that phenomena slapping on so on self without any reason with the left hand that is called optical sensory apraxia again because of the lack of positive cortical tropism then what is this frontal alien gang hand we know that frontal uh, lobe will grasp grope and hook and if this becomes extended so supposing you are standing in a queue and you are uh, your frontal alien hand which is groping it will grope into the pocket of the person who is standing nearby somebody will think that you are stealing whereas you have no knowledge about that and the frontal alien hand is one uh, thing which can be bilateral all other alien hands are on the left side only whereas the frontal alien hand can be bilateral where you may grasp your object you may hook an object or you may move around and uh, trace things from the neighborhood so people might think you are stealing second is inner manual conflict whatever the right uh, left hand wants to do the right hand will come into play and push it off and intense imbalance between intention to capture and escape so you want to do something something but the body part wants to escape so there is a competition between intention to capture and escape and each hand competes with other for carrying out motor activities mostly it is on the left hand except the frontal alien hand and you got agonistic apraxia diagonistic apraxia and intermanual conflict then what is dressing apraxia all of us know it is a pseudo apraxia because there is no voluntary reflex dissociation so with command or without command dressing difficulty remains so this is unusual for the true apraxia so we call it as a pseudo apraxia but this is supposed to be therefore due to visual spatial disorientation so you do not know which parts to go inside we should be above we should be below we should go to the shoulder due to visual spatial disorientation and sequential error is still there so you make the pleat that becomes difficult it is because of that reason that we saw that sequential is the frontal part of the praxis circuit that is why we think that till that name a praxis retained so it is seen in non dominant and dominant like the frontal alien hand dressing apraxia is also bilateral that means it is not language so it is pseudo apraxia because there is no voluntary reflex dissociation it is not language linked and uh, but still sequencing error is there therefore we are retaining the term apraxia very very common buttoning wrong so this is a one a simplest example of a dressing apraxia many many types are there they may not know put how to dress at all so many videos i have but i have not put any of them here and dissociation apraxia failure in one modality command but normal performance in other modality seeing a tool or reverse you see a tool you are not able to do 
you pantomime and do it. So these are the various kinds of errors and disconnection of indirect movement representation from modality specific input. So you have got a movement to be carried out and that is disconnected from the input. So modality specific for visual input it is not doing or auditory input it is not doing depending on which input is disconnected from the motor engram. So if you say this, we have got a uh, action tool, uh, you have got a uh, action tool uh, semantics, you have got a lexical semantics, you have got an object recognition unit, movement formula, visual association area to pandama, and you have got supplementary motor area and motor area. So depend if there is an action tool semantic to lexicon semantic is disconnected, you get a verbal dissociation apraxia. You give a command, you cannot carry it out. Second is visual motor dissociation. So if you have an object recognition unit that is disconnected, you get a visual command being not carried out. Next is the conduction apraxia where patient can do an activity without the tool, but with the tool he cannot do. So there is various kinds of disconnection results in varying kind of dissociation in the motor command. So conduction apraxia, poor ability to imitate, but preserved performance on verbal command. So they, uh, that is a strange thing. You do something and you show it, but he is unable to do. But tell him, okay, you show me how you drink a coffee, cup of coffee. That he will do. But you show him a cup of coffee being drunk. Tell him to imitate. Then he becomes difficult. These are different circuits. Seeing somebody else doing it and doing it, you know. So that is called conduction apraxia. Constructional apraxia, inability to do construction. What is that? Impairment in the combinatory or organizing activity in which details and relationship among components of the entity must be clearly perceived and can occur in both dominant and non So if you have got, uh, you make them. Uh, three dimensional constructs from single dimension or two dimensional objects. So you draw a line, you uh, change the uh, distance, keep a uh, depth uh, illusion. So that kind of converting uh, two dimensional things into three dimensional things uh, is constructional apraxia, fail constructional apraxia. So this is the thing which we commonly use. And uh, this can pick up many things, including neglect. Here, there is a construction failure. So diagonistic apraxia is uh, abnormal motor behavior of the left hand activated by voluntary right hand. So whenever the left hand acts, what should happen? Right hand should uh, keep it. Or when the right hand is doing, left hand should keep it. Because which hand is going to pick up the flower has been decided. But when you try to pick up the flower and do the puja, the left hand will come and pre prevent it. Because the left hand thinks this right hand is not belonging to him. So that is diagonistic apraxia, diagonally opposite activity is done by the left hand. And lesion of the ventral part of the posterior body of the corpus callosum and disconnection of the right superior parietal lobule. So this lesion disconnects the right superior parietal lobule. We had a patient who was some um, sitting on her left hand so that the right hand activity is not interfered by the left hand. She didn't know how to control it at all. Everything she tries to do with the right hand, the left will come. So she slowly learned to sit on her left hand so that it is suppressed. So that is diagonistic apraxia. Visual imitating, you have got meaningful gestures and meaningless gestures. So visual imitative apraxia is meaningful gestures like goodbye. Good morning, that is done. Meaningless regulating moments you do, that is not imitated. And speech apraxia, where the speech becomes slow, faulty, and errors in stress, and where you are going to stress so that the correct meaning is given, and where you are going to uh, give pressure so you assess what the person, other person is speaking, phonemic, ac phonetic accuracy, verbal distortion, and uh, consonants more difficult, and anticipating that you are having difficulty in pronouncing that you make the more recruit the muscles wrongly produce a lot of errors. That is speech apraxia. Orienting apraxia, difficulty in orienting body to other objects. 
So disruption of extra personal versus intra personal space in movement, choosing a complex route. That is what I told that when you have to lift your body part from the bend posture, that person was first bend, remaining bend, lifting his hand above the head and then bringing up the body. So you have a trajectory failure, wrong trajectory, go through like touch the nose. You can easily touch the nose like this, but you go round and touch. They are all orienting apraxias. Whereas disynchronous apraxias, inability to combine simultaneously programmed multiple movements. Supposing you do a piano play. So, so many places it should move. So, the simultaneously programmed movements become asynchronous. So, that is disynchronous. So, you remain like that. Now, to do a typing machine, you remain like that. So, that is disynchronous apraxia. Mirror apraxia, unability to reach an object in the mirror. That is called mirror apraxia. Optical sensory apraxia, spontaneous left arm movement cause voluntary striking. I, I just I told uh, that body part is not giving the positive information about what it is. So the person's left hand goes and slaps, strikes, pinches to know which body part is there. A lesion in the right basal, basal temporal occipital and thalamic region produces optical sensory apraxia. Very easy to mistake it as psychogenic problem. And craft apraxia, right hemispheric lesion causing right arm apraxia sometimes happens, that is called cross apraxia. And anterior opercular syndrome, fox johnny mary syndrome, frondoparietal opercular lesion, usually bilateral, usually happens due to birth injury, and they have got a facio, pharyngo, glasso, masticatory apraxia. These people may not be able to speak, but uh, the same muscles may be used to swallow ice cream. So you give them ice cream nicely, they'll move. You tell them to speak, the tongue will not move. So that is a voluntary reflex uh, dissociation and cannot follow commands. Next, how are you going to test this? So errors to be looked for. When an activity is given and it is carried out, the space, are they reaching the correct space? What is the time? Are they able to imitate action or non-imitational action? Meaningful gesture versus non-meaningful and conceptual errors, that is ideational. Content error, that is sequential, transitive with object, intransitive without object, sequences forming the sequence. So assessment, you do not check apraxia if the patient has got weakness, if he has got any movement disorder, if he has got comprehension failure, and if, uh, if there is improvement on correction of what he is doing. If these things are there, you will not check for apraxia, it is not there. And he should be able to identify all objects used in testing. And you have got a verbal, visual, tactile presentation of test objects. So test objects should be presented through various sensations and they will have to imitate, they will have to use the tool and they will have to do without the tool. They have to imitate meaningless representations and meaningful representations and they should do tests which involve single steps and multiple steps. And distal body versus proximal, reaching in peripersonal space versus body center space, novel movement, skill acquisition, imagine movement, and specific test for suspected type. Testing both, and, both left and right is important. Pandemine to verbal command. Show me how you will use a bread knife to cut a slice of bread, but you are not given the bread, you are not given the uh, knife. So that is pandemic, imitating without the tool. And show pictures of tools and ask them to pandemic. So first you are giving a command, that is one mode. Second mode is visual mode. Show the uh, picture and tell them to do it. And show your tool and ask them to imitate how you will. You, are not, you show your comb, but tell them not to take that comb and demonstrate how you will use that comb. And give a tool to hold and demonstrate how to use. Then uh, gestures, gestures imitate, transity, using tools, instruments, hammer, hairbrush, in transit, you only communicate, you are only given command, you are not given that uh, object. And representational, that is normal, conventional, waving goodbye. Non-representational, they are not common movements, you touch your nose wiggle your finger. They are not uh, representational tasks. 
symbolic, that is meaningful task, non-symbolic, meaningless task, all, all these imitations should be given. Multiple steps, like lighting a candle. You have put matchbox, matchstick, candle, everything, and prepare a letter to mail. And see whether he can name or recognize transitive or intransitive pandemics done by the examiner. So examiner is doing something with object, without object, and uh, see whether the person is able to do it. And imitation of classical gestures, imitation of classical movements. Idea motto, a praxia, we saw that classically we do lighting a candle, and you can give buccopharyngeal commands, blow out a uh, light put out your tongue, drink through the sip, limb command, salute, use a tool, flip a coin, comb your hair, kick a ball, whole body commands, st stand still, bow, swing a bat, and transit and intransit with objects, without objects. And the errors, what you see, patient becomes perplexed, how I will do it? That's an error. Awkward, they show awkward movements, they omit several uh, sequences, and they do place things in the wrong place, and inadequately you Use, they may not use the matchstick, but try to light the candle. And sequencing may be defective. Substitute one action with another. Keep on repeating the same action and wrong effect or position and unrecognizable gestures. These are the defects you can see. Buccopharyngeal apraxia got a 20 point questioner. Open your mouth, stick out your tongue, blow your cheek, show your tooth, pucker your lip, touch your nose with your tongue, bite your lower lip, whistle. Lick your lips, clear your throat, move tongue in and out, click your teeth, smile, hum, cling your tongue to top of your mouth, chatter your teeth as if cold, touch your chin with your tongue, cough, wiggle your tongue, puff, off, puff your cheek. These are the 20 points test to check for buccopharyngeal apraxia. At least 50% of them is there means it is a buccopharyngeal apraxia. This is called Kimurath box. So Kimurath box consists of um, if they have to do it with both hands, they have to press the button, hold on to the handle and open the drawer. So if these things are carried out properly or not, there is a uh, performance assessment scorer in that you score and uh, see how much this is screening to. Then max stick test, ask to copy patterns. They, if there is an apraxia, instead of putting them like this, they may crowd everything into one corner or they may close all the heads together, or lines may be tilted, mirror reversal instead of W, it may be M, small gaps left, uh, and the wrong ends are joined. And these are meaningful gestures, uh, which are uh, having an universal meaning, so that they can imitate. These are imitation of uh, um, uh, gestures with the fingers not having that much meaning, but they should be able to imitate this uh, 10 movements easily. And tactile version of Sangon Goddard, you have got a uh, wooden thing where so many holes are there and you have got various shapes cut out. Put that thing and put it into the corresponding hole. That is a tactile version of Sangun and Goddard. And you have to uh, describe the form feel, text, weight of the object that you see, and bilateral simultaneous timing testing should be carried out for all sensory modalities. And this you are constructing, and you've got the race diagram, you know, and uh, uh, constructing a house, the varying types of defect in construction you are seeing. And uh, common conditions where you see is Alzheimer's disease, Posterior cortical atrophy, cortical basal ganglia degeneration are the common conditions. And uh, treatment goals facilitate independence because these are patient is not having any demonstrable weakness or attack there. So people will think this is psychiatric. So education of the caregiver is very important that this is organic. Then facilitate independence by relearning land acts. So something he has learned how to comb with a uh, comb. But uh, you have to train him repeatedly to relearn that activity so that he doesn't pick up the brush and comb his hair. And personal hygiene, preparation of food, that you have to repeatedly relearn to do it the way it should be. <coughs> and encourage compensatory mechanisms like if he's unable to mix the food and eat it, you have to train him with a spoon, 
flush for ablution, all these things. So these are compensatory mechanisms can be used so that the quality remains good. And you've got from every activity, you've got compensatory mechanisms. Like if you are having a speech apraxia, you can tell them to sing. So that may be preserved. So and pharmacological agents used are levodopa, carbidopa, ropinarol, primipexol, tisanidine, donipacil, rivastigmine, galandamine, memandine, and non-pharmacological need-based training. Then um, transitive gets the training. Transitive, use a common tool. How are you going to use the pen? So you give a pen and uh, teach him repeatedly how he is hold it and hold it and use it. And picture regarding you, you are just telling him and training him one, or show a picture where a particular tool is being used so that which is of daily application in the patient's life, you can uh, tell him to use a tool and show the picture as well as demonstrate. So you can just give a command or give a picture or give a picture as well as command so that he learns to use certain objects which are mandatory for his daily life. In transitive gesture training, that is without objective, some pictures are shown, picture illustrating the context. You are not really giving the sandwich or you're not really giving the plate, but you are only showing a picture how sandwich is eaten. So looking at that, patients might learn or they may, you may do it yourself and then patient can imitate. And uh, so the second level is imitate, first is showing a picture how bread is cut and eaten. Second, somebody will cut and eat the bread. Third, he will uh, produce all the movements and tell the person to carry it out. So these are training for simple activity like combing, bathing, eating, so that they don't become dependent. In transit is non-symbolic gesture training. We have got standardized gestures for various joints, meaningless and intransitive, and patient has to imitate. And uh, treatment is technique uh, for buccopharyngeal apraxia. Technique of Sparks and Helm Mr. Brooks is converting speech into music. He's not able to speak, but he can sing. So patient can be trying to communicate through music so that he can speak out. And sing an utterance training. Repeatedly, you train the person to sing a word and gestures introduced into speaking. So you can club the speaking with gestures, which all of us do, but they can increase the gestures. And uh, then what is this tactile apraxia? So touching and carrying out a movement becomes difficult. And, but in that case, you can give visual clues or auditory clues. And multiple cue techniques. So you suppose you have to light a candle. You tell, sir, you have taken the right object. So you open the box, take out the stick, strike the stick. That is multiple cue technique. And errorless exploration and completion training. So repeatedly do the activities which are needed for that person's life and train him to do it. Then environmental change. Environment can be made to appease the patient's activity. Replace unsafe tools and task simplification training. Sing and answer training for apraxia speech. Gestural speech, that is using gestures instead of speaking for speaking apraxia. So this is how you test this. Uh, so the limb should be all right, body part should be all right, comprehension should be all right, language should be all right, yet patient is clumsy in carrying out certain activities. And it is mostly for the left hand. There is voluntary reflex dissociation. They know the object or the tool, but they do not know how to use it. That is apraxia. And uh, listen to the patient. He is giving us the diagnosis. Use technology when indicated judiciously because these things may not be picked up in the technology in the earlier phase and they may land up with the psychiatrist and always correlate with the clinical picture. And this is my teacher. This is our country. Thank you. Any questions you can ask me? It's a complex topic. What you understand? The body part is normal, but there is a failure of uh, recognition of the object to the action of the object or recognition of a motor activity and carrying out a motor activity. So motor engram failure due to the failure to carry out an activity, even though the body part is normal. And this is mainly for language dependent. When the command is not there, they may reflexively do it. So that is uh, closely mimicking psychiatric condition, but it is usually the beginning of 
ఏడీ సిబిడి 